opportunity. I'm very, very excited to be presenting today at this first ever virtual forum. Uh, quick screen share coming up and hopefully we're gonna have some fun. So uh, over here, uh, my presentation style is, is just about having fun, um, laughing a little bit, and hopefully you'll learn a few things along the way. And so this presentation is really about taking a look into the past to help it inform where the future may go specifically on life distribution side. So the title of this presentation, as you can see in front of you is around the evolution. Uh, of distribution, but we're going to take a different lens of what that looks like and how technology evolution might forecast some of the changes that we can anticipate and expect uh, on the insurance side. Uh, we're also going to laugh a little bit. Hopefully, I'm a dad. I've got two kids. Just have a, a one month old as my second. So I've got bad dad jokes. If you don't laugh, that's okay. Uh, but there are some memes and hopefully they uh, they bring a little smile to you. So to get started, who am I? Uh, I'm born and raised in Vancouver. As I mentioned, I've got two kids, a four-year-old daughter and a one-month-old son. Uh, I started my career in 2008, 2009 as a financial advisor, serving families uh, through that very, very difficult time. And of course, that has been an inspiration behind me building Fineo because I believe so strongly in the partnership between a household and a financial professional. I had the pleasure of serving on the first innovation team at TD Bank, where we took the heavy lift of reinventing the customer experience from the parking lot to the executive dashboard. So a lot of people say they don't have a great time in corporate. I enjoyed and adored mine. Uh, claim to fame for me was employee number three with a Twitter handle. Nothing was done in real time. However, uh, I then joined a, a startup as first employee, building an employee benefits exchange platform for small group insurance, specifically for companies under 100 lives. Uh, that company was acquired by Benefits by Design, where I served as managing partner uh, before going ahead to launch Vineo in 2016. Uh, along the way, I've been lucky enough to build a not-for-profit uh, tech accelerator in Vancouver, focused on youth, helping kids uh, from grade 10 to third year university go from idea to product and market, uh, and also spend a little bit of time volunteering as a entrepreneurship uh, focused professor for U of T Rotman and for our friends at Ryerson. Uh, so let's go and have some fun. We're going to take a, a short, long story about 300 years of history and uh, how innovation has changed. We're going to look at this in a couple of chapters. We'll then tell you a little bit about our point of view on the future of our industry. So number one, let's start with revolutions. Uh, revolutions are really interesting because they can take one of two shapes. They can either be a fight for good or a fight for evil. They can be a revolution. They can also be an evolution. And so as we think about how the world has evolved through technology, let's take a step back and look at where we came from. So if we look at the 1700s, we had the steam engine, right? The first true innovation. And this was the catalyst that then grew us into the industrial revolution, which brought things like electricity to the fold. Mass manufacturing became a thing. And this was all kind of a gateway into the computing era. And this computing era, as we know, has done something unique. It has connected the world. Most importantly though, what it's done is it's supercharged ours and our customers access to information. There is no more hiding behind the covers anymore. I am one Google away from basically anything that I wanna learn about. So bringing transparency, having trust, making an interactive experience is how our clients are used to be working in all other facets of their life. Therefore, we need to bring that same sort of experience here to them on financial services. Now we're kind of in this world right now around connected ecosystems and what you know the fourth industrial revolution truly is around how do we bring smart devices and traditional computing power together. Uh, you know, a couple of great examples. Let's think about Uber, right? Uber could only be proliferated because of the rise of the smartphone, which allowed for geotagging of location tracking, which then enabled us to do ride sharing. Right. I'll give you a future vision uh, that I think is really fascinating, especially as we think about autonomous vehicles. So today, as we know, you know, Tesla kind of the market leader in autonomous vehicles. But let's take that a step further. Let's fast forward to 2025. You're coming down, let's say, from Pearson Airport and you've come off hopefully a flight. You've, maybe you've been to Cancun or something, got to hang out on a beach finally. Oh, my God. And, you know, on your drive home, your Tesla, which you know has a windshield, but you're not driving. So that windshield is now turned into a media center and you might be consuming some content. And on the top left hand corner, you get a little notification. Now, the notification doesn't come from a friend or a family member. It comes from your fridge and your fridge says, hey, you're out of cheese, you're out of eggs, you're out of milk. And did you know there's a Loblaws about four kilometers away on your way home? Would you like me to place that order? Your autonomous Tesla takes you into the parking lot. A robot comes with you, comes to your car and actually loads your Tesla. That's opened the hatch automatically and you continue on your merry way home. Now, the only thing you've got to do now is take that bag and put it into your fridge. That is the power of connected devices. 
And if we take a, another look at kind of what this means at scale beyond the fourth industrial revolution, we're gonna go into the connected e ecosystems with humans and machines coming together. Uh, again, I'm gonna kind of fanboy pick on Elon Musk, but you know, he's working on Neuralink, uh, a technology that allows us to implant chips into people's brains so that they can hopefully get better recovery from things um, like if they've been paralyzed let's say in an accident. But the vision of Neuralink is really to be able to access information right from the cloud into your brain. So now no longer do we have to think about carrying just cell phones, we can just think a thought and we will be able to be connected with our technology. And as crazy and as scary as that might sound, that is not too far away in the future. And I think it's important for us to remember not just where we've come from, where we're going, but predicting where the world might go so that we can be better prepared to take those opportunities on. One of the things about connected worlds is the quick adoption of technology and how fast this can happen. And I love this chart because it actually is the perfect example of how today's world adopts technology differently. It took 75 years for 100 million people to adopt the phone. In two years, cell phones hit 100 million users. And for those of you who have kids or maybe even did play the game Pokemon Go, um, that app in one month at 100 million users. So it just tells you that the pace of change, the pace of adoption, and therefore the pace of your customer is completely changed from where it started before. And again, if we continue down the trajectory of where the evolution of technology is gonna go, we then think about real time. And real time enablement, you know, for example, smart, smart devices and video calling. I mean, for those of us that have had to now do work from home every single day, we need really great video strategies. We need really great ways to engage our customers and we need top tier internet. And you know, again, little Elon Musk plug, but things like Starlink that are now giving satellite uh, internet capabilities to people in rural areas is again, just proliferating the speed of adoption, the speed of change uh, and connected devices and connected experiences. And so I'm harping on this point for a reason and we'll come back to why connection matters a little bit later in the presentation. Now, if we think about the evolution of technology as we've gone through this mask of uh, industrial towards the fourth industrial revolution, many of us are very aware of big data and data warehousing. And, and of course, how important it is to have all that data secure, safe, and in the cloud so that we can run things like analytics over top of it. The analytics that we run over top of it is really to create predictions of the future. And when we get technologies that teach other technologies, for example, machine learning, we can start to pattern recognize. And from there, we can start to create interpretations of what that technology or what that data set might look like towards a future forecast. Now, artificial intelligence is a very fancy buzzword, but we are on the cusp of machines making decisions on behalf of humans at a rate that we simply could not even understand. Uh, the world of chess has gone through some very, very interesting um, revolutions and the, the game of the century was played uh, that we'll talk a little bit more about later where you know Gary Kasparov, a world champion, ended up losing uh, to a supercomputer. And this was truly the first place that we learned that in a game that humans have owned for from the 1700s to now, a computer could finally make that decision better than a human. A scary but true reality. Now, as we move you know, further and further up the chain, which we won't talk about today, but you know, the future world of singularity where truly humans and computers are one, uh, we're almost there already. If you think about the fact that your cell phone is an extension of you, I mean, we all carry around our phones in our pocket constantly. We have access to effective super intelligence comparative to you know past generations who maybe were on a flip phone or maybe had to have a that lovely thing you had to you know roll roll your finger through to actually make a phone call happen. So now if we go to chapter two, this is now the interesting part, which is information. And how do we go from cars to computers? And there's a really interesting parallel example of how consumer behavior and consumer shopping has evolved over the years. And let's look at the retail car industry as a parallel example. Now, this is no different from maybe if we took at like retail financial services, but there was a time where, you know, we didn't have Kijiji, we didn't have Craigslist, we didn't have autotrader.com, right? We had to go into a physical location where a person was sitting on one side of a table and that person had full control of the information. They had the brochures, they had the specs of the cars, they had the pricing, they had the models. And what they decided to share with us is the information that us as consumers could actually interpret. And now that playing field has been completely leveled. Information asymmetry is, is, is called, where now consumers with one click, as I was mentioning earlier, can go and learn anything. This is very, very critical and very important because what it means is that consumers are making buying decisions before they meet a professional. 
And the professional's role is now changing from becoming purely just a person who gives information to now a person who has to drive education, help to actually have empathetic conversations, and most importantly, be the person who's the steward and the shepherd of the client versus the person who is the information bearer to the client. And that is a wholesale shift in how financial services has been done, uh, even if I think about my time in 2008, 2009. Although, you know, you could have gone online and gone to a market and seen how the markets were changing, you typically still came in and spoke to your financial advisor to understand the markets. That's not the case anymore. And now people are, are now watching the news constantly on Twitter every single day, on Instagram, and TikTok, and all these other social networks I don't even know about anymore. But this is a really critical piece of the puzzle to understand the future consumer. Now, taking a look at financial services in general, you know, financial services are effectively marketplaces where on the one side you have product access, on the other side you have product distribution, and in the middle there is a service layer. So let's take a look at, again, the evolution of marketplaces. And we had the listing era, right, where I could just go to Craigslist and pick something or Kijiji. And those were really simple. They were easy, basic filtering options. And then we had the unbundling of these Craigslist or these listings into vertical specific marketplaces, right? So for example, Fiverr, uh, the, the tagline was pay $5 for a service professional and somebody could whip up a logo for you for five bucks or something like that. Then we moved into the Uber for everything experience where everything's real time, right? Consumers now have no patience. And if the thing doesn't arrive to me in the next hour, I don't want it. And this is a really important theory about how consumer behavior changes and how we need to think differently about how we drive value and how we share information and how we build transparency and trust. Then we're moving into these managed marketplace eras where, again, you know, software tools are available to allow people to connect, have conversations online, to be able to have what is, what's called imper, uh, interoperability between systems. But now if we look at kind of the next evolution, that's called service marketplaces, where we're moving into places where simply having supply and demand there is not enough. We need a service professional in the middle to, again, shepherd and steward the customer towards a buying process. And the, the kind of access on the bottom, complexity is what drives us towards having to create these service enabled marketplaces. And again, thinking of financial services at large, that's effectively what we are today. Now, again, thinking about the customer, the world before the world today and where the world is going. There's a few things that we have to highlight here. Number one is of course, everybody needs access to now basic technology. Consumers just will not accept paper anymore. I mean, yes, there are still some people that wanna see a piece of paper and a pen, but en masse, everybody has now become very comfortable with technology. The other thing is the ability to access you and access information 24 seven. It is not enough now to have a shop with a retail hour because people are doing business anywhere, anytime, any place. I'll give you a really great, interesting uh, insight from a friend of mine uh, the other day. He was doing some research on direct-to-customer financial services and realizing that the, the largest propensity for consumers under 45 to purchase actually happens between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. Why is that? Because the kids are finally asleep. And that's a paradigm shift. So if you're not able to actually give your customer that access in a 24-7 way across devices, you're losing opportunities that you don't even know that you're missing out on. The other is, is this whole concept of, you know, agent or financial professional working out of systems. Now, one of the biggest problems in our industry today across financial services is the fact that agents, advisors, and brokers are killing their productivity with redundant data entry, with the, having to hop between multiple systems to do the job, and the lack of connectivity in these systems. Now, of course, Fineo is going to talk a little bit more later about how we're trying to solve that for our industry, but what we really need is a one-stop shop an ecosystem where all of this work can be done. Think about your, your cell phones today, right? If you're on an Apple device, you know, your iOS, that is your operating system. On top of that operating system are different applications, but it's a one place where you can go to do multiple things. The world of financial services needs to become more connected and it needs to have more of an ecosystem approach. You know, my, one of my biggest inspirations in, in the life has been you know, Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs on stage, um, you know, years ago was, was asked a, a really crazy question by somebody. And, and the question was around kind of, you know, why, why does Apple believe so strongly that it should control the customer experience? And like, could, could it be done a different way? And Steve Jobs said something, I think, phenomenal that we should all really think about. And he said, when we're designing product or we're designing experiences, we start with the customer first and then we work ourselves back into the technology, not the other way around. And if you think about that, it's so, so impactful because most technology today that brokers, advisors are using were actually designed for enterprise. And now they've kind of worked themselves back to consumer and they're opening up customer portals or opening up broker portals, but it's the wrong approach. 
the right approach is to start with the customer experience first. Think about the service professional who's dealing with that customer and then work your way back into the infrastructure and work your way back into the tech stack. And again, it's a paradigm shift. It's a small observation, but it's a completely different analogy on how technology and software is built. Um, the future is no different than the past. It's very, very similar. And I think we need to understand, again, where we've come from to understand where we're going. However, we also have to appreciate that the times are changing and that doing what got us here will not take us there and that we are at risk of losing opportunities if we're not willing to make the changes. There was a very famous startup in uh, 2014, 2015, actually one of the reasons why I started Finale. And this company was called Zenefits out of Silicon Valley. And Zenefits uh, founder at the time, you know, very famously was on a, was on a stage in New York um, at, at an event called Disrupt New York, which was all about cutting edge technology. And he said blatantly, financial professionals, I'm coming to drink your milkshake because you can't serve your customers the way that I can. And effectively what they did is they provided HR solutions, HR in a box free to small businesses. And in return, took an agent of record so that the employee benefits commissions flowed to Zenefits. And although that company, you know, had a, a couple of regulatory hiccups and, you know, ended up uh, maybe a little bit lackluster than what a lot of people thought, it raised over $500 million and had a billion dollar valuation in two years after launch. So it tells you that they were able to make a huge impact in the world with this whole mantra of people don't need brokers, they only need technology. And so again, we are at risk. When we think about competition, um, you know, the, the founder of Netflix was on a panel and I'll never forget uh, what, what the question was on stage. Somebody, the moderator asked him, who's Netflix's biggest competition? And he, you know, everybody in the audience was ready to say, oh, it's going to be Hulu. It's going to be Disney Plus. It's Amazon Prime. And his answer blew us all away. He said, sleep is my biggest competitor. Why is that? Sleep is my biggest competitor because what stops you from watching your next Netflix episode is that you get tired and you want to go to bed. So the pillow is my biggest competitor. So what did he do about that? They created a whole stream of content as interactive content where you actually had to pick your own pathway. So you'd get to a fork in the road in, in like a TV show or in a movie and you'd actually get to pick the adventure that the story took from there. Creating interactive content was his ability to combat sleep can you believe how he had to think differently and how Netflix had to think differently about what competition meant? I won't even get into the blockbuster story, but we all know what happened there. Now, again, timing. Timing is extremely important. And there's something to think about where devices are changing access and changing the ability of us to do our jobs and the way that we interact with customers. And the ability to do something on a tablet, the ability to do something on a mobile device. The not have to require you to take your, your filing cabinet with you on the road speeds up your ability to do your job. And your customers expect that level of access every day. And therefore, you need a toolkit that allows you to, to serve your customer and serve your business that way. I talked a little bit about chess earlier. And, uh, you know, th this was another great TED talk um, that was done by Gary Kasparov, who is, you know, one of the, the greatest chess players in history. And he went through a, a real interesting spiel about how there was a, a chess tournament that was run human versus machine and human and machine versus machine. And what they found was that a player who was a lower level player, but paired with a computer could outperform both a supercomputer and outperform a grandmaster in chess. So what that tells us is that it's not an either or solution here. It's not humans, it's not machines, it's the connectivity between them to create best in class customer experiences. And to do that, we have to be very deliberate and thoughtful about how we think about technology and our practices. And that really takes me to where we go next. And, and this is, you know, from sticks to bits. And um, this here is, I think, the most important slide of this entire presentation, which is technology is not the answer. Technology is a piece of the answer, but technology itself is not the answer. The answer is how you actually think strategically about embedding technology into your business. And what that means is just like anything with your business, you have to have a strategy, you have to have a plan, you have to have metrics, you have to have goals, and you have to have an execution plan. And it is not, again, just turn on the software and it works. I mean, earlier in this uh, today, you know, there was a discussion around CRM and how CRM can become this like bane of my existence problem. But the reality is that CRM is a tool a functional tool to help you keep track of your customers and keep track of your data and to make sure things don't slip through the crap. But it's how you embed technology into your business processes that actually create the efficiencies that you're looking for. So if you think that just by you know, turning on a couple of pieces of software, life is gonna get better for you, it's not. What's gonna get better is to take a step back, really think deeply about your customer journey, think deeply about what it is you're trying to achieve and why, 
And then forget about trying to like eat the elephant in one bite. Take one piece of your customer journey. There's a really great you know, process that tech companies take where we will take a, a whiteboard or a bunch of sticky notes and we will basically put them on a wall and say, this is the journey from the first customer touch point all the way till the end of that relationship. And for many of us, that end actually is not in, at all the case because it's a generational transfer to the next uh, you know, part of that family. And what we need to understand is all the different moving pieces along this customer journey. And let's pick a few pieces to, uh, to automate at a time. Maybe that's the customer onboarding piece. Maybe it's the fact find piece. Maybe it's how you think about data storage, how you think about follow-up connectivity and, and pieces around that. But let's not try to eat the elephant in one bite. And I think it's really important to start small, think big, execute fast. So where do we go from here? I, I love this one. You know, of course, we can't lose our jobs if we're, we're the one automating the work. And so that takes me into, you know, our mission as a company is really to, to help uh, insurance professionals or those who focus on insurance really create heroic moments for their clients. You know, if I think back to my time, 2008, 2009, I had to say a lot of bad things to clients. No, policy declined. Uh, procedure says we can't, right? But our, our job when we put on that business suit is we're actually putting on a cape. We are serving families and let's not, let's not take that lightly. You know, we are the superheroes to their future and we need to really put a lot of stock into what that means. Uh, so Fineo as a company, you know, we started in 2016 with this mission of bridging this digital divide between insurance companies, insurance distributors and their customers. And this is a very, very important problem to solve. Uh, as we know, a bulk of insurance distribution happens through the independent channel network, and we really believe that consumers are going to continue to need great advice. Although there is a segment of customer who's going to want to buy direct, that's okay. They should be able to have that access. However, you know, the process really needs to get cleaned up so that our service professionals can play on an equal playing field versus the direct to customer offerings. And so if we kind of take a, a step deeper and we look at the industry challenge today, Insurance is dealing with this very fragmented and clunky supply chain problem. And the supply chain has multiple issues with it. You know, one of it is that there's really no great data standards of moving information up and down the supply chain from customer to distributor up to carrier and back. And so that lack of standards, or you might hear the term API, uh, which is just a fancy way of saying connecting two systems to allow for secure data exchange to happen both ways. Uh, we need these data standards. The second challenge that we have, and we talked about this earlier in the presentation, is the fact that agents and brokers and advisors are doing their job in multiple places. There's no unified front end to the solution. And effectively what's happening is we're just killing our own productivity and creating a lot of friction in the customer experience and the broker experience. Think about the amount of times that you have to manually redundantly enter the same customer's information. Every time you do that, there's data error potential, but most importantly, we're wasting very talented human capital to do redundant data entry. And that's not where we should be spending our time. That's where machines should be spending theirs. So our vision for this industry, and we've been working extremely hard to solve this problem over the years, is to pull this all together into one seamless ecosystem where we can allow information to move seamlessly between carrier, broker, and customer, where we can have a unified experience from prospect all the way to policy issuance, and around this ecosystem to actually create a marketplace where we can then allow other professional vendors, other professional technology companies to plug in so that we can, again, give our brokers or our advisors an operating system to launch into multiple parts of their day from, but always have a home base that they can call their own. Uh, again, we enable, you know, brokers, that's really the core of what we do. And we do this in, in a few different ways. You know, our system allows, again, for a full white labeled capability so that your brand can be centric in front of your clients. We give you the ability to shop from multiple carriers, but do more than just price comparison, because as we know, price is just one axiom of a decision. The other is what features, what benefits, and what suitability looks like. In under five minutes, you can have basically a comparison report fully white labeled for you. We also provide you with access to what we call a client wallet or a client portal, which you can send to your client to go through self onboarding on a fact find. You can share notes with them. So no more do you have to send them you know, emails. We don't know where Google do document storage is, but I can tell you for a fact, videos is all held in Canada. Um, any document that you upload into your customer file can be shared with your client. And just like you can with an email money transfer, you can request your client to upload a document, which then shares into the Fineo ecosystem. And we're doing some really phenomenal R&D work on how to, again, create some really fast efficiencies on application uh, and creating you know, the industry's first unified application. That's really our mission. Uh, and we're making some groundbreaking um, progress towards that. Uh, I'm not sure if the industry is fully ready for it, but your friends here at Fineo surely are. 
Um, you know, we feel very blessed and very lucky to have been recognized for some of our accomplishments over the last few years. But most importantly, it's partnerships like the one we have with, with now that I believe are really going to catalyze this industry. If we know something about this industry is that carriers will change when distribution pushes the change and pushes the ask. And so what we need is we need the revolution to come from the bottom. Advisors, if you love what we're doing and if you love the future of technology, you need to be the ones using the tech because that is the proof point to carriers that they need to make behavior change. Ultimately, our, our vision for this industry is to build that connectivity and build that fabric so that we can help you create best in class customer experiences. Uh, and so we hope that you know, you'll know you join us on this journey. Uh, as part of your experience working with New Outlook, you get all of technology from Pineo for free, so you're not paying for any of it. Uh, so we're just here as a value added provider. Uh, we believe again, that we should be providing democratic access to you know, best in class technology so that you don't feel like cost is a barrier. And most importantly, what we wanna help you with is to build a better connectivity and a better experience with your customer. And that's really what we're fighting for for you. So uh, with that, we've got a few minutes left if anybody would like to ask any questions, but um, that is the end of my slides.